you know, we're in the midst of the NBA championship, so I gotta tell the story from Kirk Goldsberry, who's a local author, um, also a, an adjunct at Harvard, um, working with the stats department. But it really gives you an idea of what's happening in the world of athletics. Two years ago, or two finals ago, uh, the Spurs were beaten by the Miami Heat. It was a rough and tumble, um, you know, last minute thing. They should have won game six. They ended up losing in game seven. It was a big challenge for them. They came back and began to lick their wounds and said, how do we beat a team like Miami that has great player, good players all the way around, but they have the greatest player on the planet, right? So how are you gonna beat a team with the greatest player on the planet, LeBron James? And they began to look back and think about the, the leverage of the data. Now, for those of you who don't know, in the world of athletics, a analytics has suddenly taken off, especially in the last 10 years. Um, 15, 20 years ago, stats for the NBA was basically a guy on the bench keeping check marks, and that would turn that into a spreadsheet, and the spreadsheet would do some basic analysis. Kind of sounds like our old IR offices, right? Okay, but then in the last like five years, 10 years, they've installed cameras in every single NBA arena. They now capture every single moment of every single game and they know this person passed to this person, they dribbled there, they, did, they literally have big data on every single moment of the game. They then can take those data away and analyze them. And one of the things they did is they developed a feature variable by combining those variables because people used to think the stats you had to keep, you really focus on were how many points did they score? How many rebounds did they get? How many assists did they get? Those are the big things everybody paid attention to. These statisticians went away and said, that's not the best use of your analysis, and actually, they tell some lies, right? So you get a lot more offensive rebounds when you miss a lot of shots, right? So the idea, they had to figure out things like efficiency, and they actually came up with one index called EPV, and EPV is a calculated variable, and it's called expected possession value. And what expected possession value is, is given this pass or this dribble move or this handoff, your likelihood of scoring goes up or goes down. Your expected possession value goes up or goes down based on that move. And they analyzed every player to look at the average of their decisions that they make to look at whether or not their EPV, personal EPV, was a positive or a negative EPV. And what they found out was players like, if you know basketball, Tony Parker's the point guard for the San Antonio Spurs, ridiculously good point guard, great decision maker. His EPV is fantastic. When he touches the ball, good things happen. Then they had other players like Boris Diaw. Everybody likes Boris Diaw, but Boris Diaw was an EPV disaster. I mean, every time he just made decisions that hurt the Spurs. And so what they decided to do is they couldn't show this chart to their players because this chart actually analyzed, this is the kind of chart that analyzed every single movement and every single decision. What they came away with was, let's put together, and the coaches work with a design group to think about this, what are the three things that each player could do that would, that would make them go in the e positive EPV direction? What are just the three things each of these players can do to contribute to a positive EPV? And they spent the entire season trying to get those players to adopt those three basic things. And that way, when you combine those up and you have you know, basically 10 players that play on the Spurs, they, all 10 of them to adopt those EPV changes, you suddenly get a much more efficient offense where the whole idea is you move the ball around to the place where the person is taking the best shot with the least amount of defense. What happened in the finals last year? Spurs won, and they won in how many games? They won in five games, and everybody said, how did that happen? They took apart the Miami Heat completely, and part of it was because they did this work, right, to analyze how they can make this shift. Now, did they forget old school basketball? Absolutely not. What they did is they combined the best of basketball tradition with the best of the new de data and technology and figured out a design thinking way to kind of pull these data together. By the way, if you're into the, into the athletic analytics literature, um, this book, Faster, Higher, Stronger, is one of the best reads. It's by Mark McCluskey. It talks about elite athletes and why elite athletes are so much better than everyday athletes. But the three things I want to point out of, the, out of this book that are related to our work in education, because we're going to go right into education next. One is one of the things they've clearly learned from the work with elite athletes is that the reason elite athletes are better than the athlete next to them is not necessarily because they're genetically gifted. It's because elite athletes share a very common characteristic. They are power learners. In fact, this is the money quote. The ability to learn faster than your competitors may be the only sustainable competitive advantage. 
they take advantage of something called aggregated marginal gains. Aggregated marginal gains means small moves. So if, a, if an athlete learns something and gets better at something little by little every single day, and they're really committed to it, and they get better and better and better and better and better and better and better, by the time they do that for a couple years, guess what? They're a lot better than the person next to them, right? And the whole idea is they're constantly trying to make all, all kinds of better moves. So in addition to aggregated marginal gains, the other big thing they learned is something called the N of one. And this is an important thing for trustees especially to think about. The N of one is the idea that, here's what elite athletes have learned. They are surrounded by people who have good ideas for them. Elite athletes are completely surrounded by people who have great ideas for them. Dietitians and nutritionists who know exactly how they should eat if they're gonna perfect their body. Trainers who know exactly how they should train to make sure they're in the best shape. Basketball people, football people who really know the game who think this is the strategy that's gonna transform them. What elite athletes have learned is all, that, all of that skill and will that's being imparted upon them by dietitians and trainers and the rest is directional. It's important that they should listen to it and try to learn from it. There's lots of experience there, but they've also learned the lesson of the N of one, which means some of it works for them, some of it doesn't work for them. They've actually learned that some of these diet, they have to test it on themselves. How does this diet work with my body and does it actually work? How does this training regimen work with my body and does it actually work? How many of you have ever done a diet that didn't really work? Right? Somebody else swears by it, but for you, does not work for you, right? The same thing, these guys have learned, these women and men have learned that some diets, uh, admonitions, absolutely important to follow, some of it does not work for them at all. Same thing with the training. And so what they learn is that best practices are directional, but they have to tune it to them. They have to figure out how this plays out with them.